All right, folks, this is it. This is the time that we're going to figure out DTS with nothing but a little twisty thing, some tape, and a zip tie. Check this out. No, 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 we're not, we're not gonna, that's not what we're gonna do. <laughs> but today we're gonna talk about DTS. Initially I thought DTS was just a uh, reserve component thing, a National Guard and Reserve thing because we don't use it often or the population of soldiers who use it, use it infrequently. Recently I've been talking to some of my counterparts on the active duty side and one of the things they explained to me is that when are active duty soldiers really using DTS? because he was facing very similar issues as a user, not as a, you know, not as a, a supervisor, but as a user of not knowing exactly how to navigate the system. Now, as a approving uh, officer for uh, DTS, I got to see a lot more examples of what right and what wrong looks like. I got formal training, I got a certificate. The bluff is realizing that this is very, very common. Uh, not knowing how to approach DTS, getting your vouchers and your authorizations incorrectly, not knowing the difference between the two. But here I am, and this is what we're going to talk about. First thing I want to discuss is that the difference between an authorization and a voucher. An authorization is the first step to initiating your defense travel system request. Basically, an authorization is you asking your organization to commit government dollars to your particular travel. So they authenticate that yes, you are authorized to make this travel, and then yes, you can allocate or you can commit government dollars to this particular travel. Because it's legal, it's authorized, and you're required to attend whatever that travel may be. Once you complete the travel, then you need to close out the event, essentially, by completing a voucher through DTS, which is almost the exact same process. That's where you dish out the money to your government travel card or the, to yourself as per diem for the travel that you just completed. Before you start your authorization, you will receive an email from your organization saying you are to go on this trip. Let's say NCO yes. So you'll get an email from your tra training NCO usually or your operations sergeant saying you are to attend this NCO yes. So once you get that email, you usually have a reservation in ATARS for a specific school, which means that you should have an email in your inbox saying, hey, welcome, you are now enrolled in this program. Here are all the instructions. That piece of document is gonna be one of the most informative things that you have as you try to set up your authorization. If you do not get a welcome email, you can go on ATARS, search the specific course that you are attending in that specific location in that schoolhouse and in there they will have coordinating instructions. The key things that you need to find out when setting up your authorization in DTS is where are you going, how are you getting there, where are you staying, where are you eating, who's paying for it and then who are you routing this authorization through. Let's, let's go one step at a time. Where are you going? So when you are an M-Day soldier and you are given orders to active duty for training, you are then responsible to know the start and the end date and make sure that your travel falls within that time. Since you are most likely not the first soldier in your organization to attend that NCO yes, your training NCO will know all the, all the requirements for travel time and return time uh, for your particular school. So look at those dates and those are the dates that you need to keep in mind as you're setting up your travel. How are you getting there? You are, your start time or your start date starts from your home record usually. From there you need to get to your mode of transportation. So are you driving to the school? Are you flying to the school? So if you are flying to the school, you need to get yourself from your home record to the airport. How are you getting there? So if you're driving yourself, you need to find out, is the government going to pay for me to park my car at the airport or do I need to take a taxi? Boom, answer that question. If you're flying there, once you get to the airport, when are you authorized to fly? So that will be the first day of your orders usually. Once you arrive at the destination, 
how are you getting from the airport to your check-in location, right? So is the schoolhouse going to provide a shuttle? Is, is, are you authorized to take a taxi? Are you authorized to uh, have a car rental for the duration of the course? Or whatever the situation may be. Uh, and, and those are the things that you need to answer. How are you getting there? Once you get that information, write that down. Now that you know where you're going and how you're getting there, you need to figure out where you're staying. So on a welcome letter, it'll say government quarters provided, meaning you're gonna stay at barracks free of charge to the soldier. Or it will say you will stay on on post hotel, which is civilian run, but it's on the installation. That will determine also your transportation between your class and <clears throat> the specific uh, hotel that you're staying at on post. It may be a situation where on post hotel or even barracks may not have availability. In that case, you need to be prepared for that and you need to estimate how much it will cost for you to get off post lodging. Back to the transportation. In the event that you are required to get off post lodging because government quarters was not available, how are you getting from your off post lodging to your classroom? Are you then going to be authorized to have a rental car or are there clusters of hotels nearby where a school shuttle comes by and picks up students that are off post? These are things you need to answer. So once you figure that out, write it down. In the event of non-availability, the schoolhouse will give you a statement of non-availability because that is the memo that you're going to need to collect money in the back end to pay for your hotel off post. So keep that in mind. Next question that you need to answer is, where are you eating? Is it government provided meal, meals free of charge to the soldier? Are you getting subsidized meal at the DFAC? If you are getting subsidized meal, is the DFAC open all of the days that you are there? Meaning not just Monday through Friday, but every single day, including weekends or any holidays in which may overlap or may be fall within the dates that you were in school? Or are you gonna have to eat off of the economy or at the DFAC and you're paying full price for DFAC meals? These are all important because this will determine your meal allowance, right? Part of your meal incidentals, which is part of your per diem. Once you figure that out, write it down. And then who's going to pay for this? The way that the Army uh, sets up the payment system within DTS is that they set up different bank accounts where your finance professionals are responsible to monitor the balances of those banking accounts. And the numbers or the codes for those banking accounts are called lines of accounting. So LOAs, you may hear that a lot. Find out what that line of accounting is, meaning who's paying for it. If it's within your brigade, you usually have access to it. If it's a conventional training line of accounting, you should be able to pop down within DTS, click on it, and, and, and it, should, it should show up. Uh, if it's not, you need to make sure that your organization is prepared to cross argue to have access to the line of accounting. They're not moving your entire account into the hierarchy to have access to the line of accounting, but instead what they're doing is, is that they're giving you specific access for your DTS account to see that line of accounting. And that's how you're gonna pay for it. Some states, this could be a lengthy process, especially if it's really high up in your organization, such as your Army National Guard headquarters or your state headquarters, even division headquarters, if you don't have access to those lines of accounting, if it's not within your organization's chain. So find out who's paying for it, make sure you have the correct line of accounting and make sure that you have access to the line of accounting. Write it down. The last step is routing. Who are you routing this through? So there is usually within DTS, you will see routing lists. A routing list is a list of groups. Think of it as a group email, like a, uh, one of those mass distribution emails where you have one word and it covers a lot of email addresses, right? Like G3 training, and it'll cover all the members of G G3 training. Same concept with your routing list. Your routing list will allow the individuals that are going to review your authorization and who are going to approve your authorization to actually see your DTS, your authorization request. That way, once you submit your authorization, those individuals automatically can see it and they, they can push through the process. If you don't route it through the route, correct routing list, your DTS will just sit there in the queue 
and nobody's going to action it because they don't know who authorized for you to make that trip and they don't know the details about your trip. So that's key. Once you have gathered all that information, you have the welcome email from your school, I would even say have your organization email you a copy of the reservation, your ATARS reservation, so you have all the documents shown in your orders, obviously, if you have access to that, and you're going to initiate a DTS authorization. You're gonna use the first date and your last day of your orders, which usually will coincide with the first date and the last day of your travel. You are going to select the destination that you are going to, which will determine your per diem. You are then going to select your flight, which is usually the cheapest flight, uh, unless for some reason the cheapest flight does not get you to the school in time for check-in, in which case you have to justify that. And then if you're authorized transportation, make sure you then book your transportation through DTS. And then additional expenses that you may see. If you're, if you're booking something from overseas or to overseas, there may be some kind of currency conversion. So talk to other people who may have gone through this destination and, and see what those charges are. If you're driving through tolls, make sure you estimate how much tolls you have and those will all fall under additional expenses. Same thing with gas. If you're driving to the school, parking, if you're parking at the destination, and any kind of other expenses associated with your travel that doesn't fall under, that's not covered by your per diem. Once you have your lodging rate, your per diem rate, you're ready to submit. Make sure you select the correct line of accounting and then make sure you route it through the correct routing channel and you press submit. One thing that I recommend is that once you press submit on that authorization, immediately email and call the individual that you are in contact with about this trip and that you look, you click back into that authorization request and you go down to signatures and see the status of your authorization request. It will show that you have signed, that you created, created an authorization and that you have signed it. Right below that, it will be the list of individuals who are reviewing officers in your routing list and you can click on the arrow it's difficult sometimes to get the drop down to work and you see the names of each individual you can email blast all those people and say hey i just submitted a voucher uh, or a correction i just submitted a, an authorization can you please take a look at it and review it and then you can do the same thing for the approving uh, officer however Give it a couple of days unless that if you're down to like the wire and it's crunch time and you need to have your, you know, especially if you're within 72 hours, make sure you start emailing people and make sure that your organization is helping you contact those people to get your authorization reviewed and then your authorization um, approved. Once you complete the trip, you're going to come back with all of those receipts. You need to make sure that if you are authorized to rent a vehicle that you have a zero balance receipt meaning it shows all the charges, shows your payment, and then it shows zero balance. Same thing for your hotel. If you incurred parking fees, make sure you have the receipts for parking. If you incurred gas, make sure, obviously you're gonna incur gas. If you rented a vehicle, make sure you keep that. If you took a taxi, make sure you have receipts for those. Receipts for anything outside of meals, make sure you have a receipt, and if it's something major like a hotel, or a rental car that you have a zero balance receipt, meaning that you got a bill and then you paid and it shows that you paid and the balance is zero. Once you, once you have that, you're gonna go and initiate a voucher. Then it's gonna give you the option to select from authorizations, which you will see the authorization for that particular trip. You're gonna select that and a lot of the information will already be there and it'll tell you what you need receipts for. That's when you start uploading all your receipts into the particular chargers field. All your other stuff that you need to upload should already be there, which will be associated with your orders or school information. Anything that a reviewing officer will need to review to make sure that all the charges are legit, make sure you upload it in there in the appropriate line. If it doesn't have a particular line for it, make sure you put, uh, put it under supporting documentation. Those things are important to expedite your voucher getting you paid. The last piece of uh, information that you need is your credit card statement. Obviously, unless your credit card statement closed the day after you completed your trip, 
you are not going to see any of your charges on any of the recent statements, which means they need to start communicating with your organization about are they okay with you grabbing a screenshot of your recent charges from your online login of your government travel card. And if they're cool with that, which for what I see most are, you can, as long as it shows your name or any kind of identifying information about that card belonging to you and used for that trip, put that up there, highlight the charges, and upload it as a supporting document for anything that you spent money on that's associated with your trip that is not associated with your meals. And that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, I didn't want to show you step-by-step step in DTS because I still need to do a little bit of research and make sure that it's kosher for me to show those screens. Uh, this is public information. The military actually has uh, several videos on, on doing your DTS. It gets a little more uh, detailed than what I just went through. I just give you an overview on the documentation so you understand the concept of DTS, but they go into details of the functionalities. But what's important is that you make sure that you look at this list here, that you have, you can answer these questions and then that you also look at this list here and you have these pieces of documents so you can complete your authorization and then when you get back, you can complete your voucher expeditiously so you get paid, your credit card get paid, you're not on the naughty list and you're not getting harassing emails about completing your DTS. Most importantly, so you don't mess up on your authorization and miss the opportunity to attend whatever trip it is that you're doing a DTS for. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see if I make the next video. All right, see you on the next one. Peace.